Last game. We need a little pep talk here. What, what have we got? What? This is the uh, old ghost. Pardon? What do we got? We don't got much. We don't. Remember, the, what, is, what are the... Uh... Full-time hockey guys. Any <laughs> Shore. Syllabs. There we go. Yeah. I only remember the last game, so we got to win it. You won the last game. No, this is the game this we're going to remember. This is the last game. Bob, you're our senior statesman. Senior statesman, that's right. Right. Make a statement. Journey party beer never hurt nobody. Hi there. Yeah, that was the dressing room before the game. It's our last game of the year. We won by quite a margin. We gathered at the pub for lunch. I videoed everyone on my iPhone, asked them all what would motivate them to learn a language. But I'm so bad at these things, I didn't have, I had run out of space on my iPhone. Uh, so we won't get to see that. One fellow said that he wanted to learn Polish because his wife was Polish. And after 33 years of marriage, he wanted to understand what his wife's family was saying about him. There's a motivation. So um, I can't help it. I shouldn't. But I'm going to talk about language and politics with specific reference to the situation in Ukraine. Uh, one of the joys of having learned Russian is that I can watch programs like an exchange between Telekanal Dosh, which is a, an independent television station in Russia, and Pyatakanal Kanal, fifth kana channel in Ukraine. Uh, there were about eight people on the Ukrainian side, maybe eight or nine people on the Russian side, and they kind of went back and forth. The first thing that impressed me is that all of these um, Ukrainian Tele television personalities that I had been listening to in Ukrainian and not understanding. Of course, they spoke Russian. Absolutely, I mean, to my mind, flawless Russian. I couldn't tell the difference between them and the Russians. It always impresses me when people are so fluent in two languages, completely at home in two languages. The, uh, the, Russian, the, the Ukrainian side was more or less united in their condemnation of the actions of the Russian government, the Russian president, and of course, their defense of the territorial integrity of Ukraine, including the Crimea. Um, the Russian side was more divided. I think uh, Telekan Aldosh had made a point of inviting a variety of different people, some who are very you know, pro-government, some who, are, uh, who question what the government is doing and so forth. So you had a bit of a, uh, a divergence of opinion. Uh, what came out of the Russian side, particularly those that supported uh, Putin and the Russian government, was that they felt the important issues were that the, Ukraine, the people in the Crimea wanted independence and had the right to self-determination, and that Russia has the right to protect Russians, ethnic Russians who live in other countries, and to protect uh, or work or foster the, a proper role for the Russian language. Uh, there was a fair amount of misinformation. I don't know whether what all is true or not. Uh, I, I hear from a lot of Ukrainians, even Russian-speaking Ukrainians, that they are not in any way discriminated against in Ukraine. However, I heard an interview between uh, Alexei Venediktov of EKMSB and the Minister of Education in the new government, and he said that in the universities in Ukraine, there are two languages, Ukrainian and English. I say to myself, when so much of the population speaks such excellent Russian, why wouldn't Russian be a language of instruction in the universities. Uh, you can still have everyone learn Ukrainian uh, in elementary school, but uh, if you're a, a scientist, if you're publishing papers, if you want to go and study, I mean, you've got beside you a country that's three times your size with an international repetition, as does the Ukraine, as Ukraine. But but why would you, why do you have to have English and Ukrainian at the expense of Russian? I don't understand that. I think that's not wise. However, I'm not Ukrainian. I have no right to say what they do. I can offer my opinion on it. But then the Russian government does also not have the right to impose anything on Ukraine. There might be international meetings about the role of, of uh, you know, other international languages, such as Russian, which is an international language. There are many ways of putting pressure on them uh, and raising this issue. Uh, but it's not justification for any kind of military action. Uh, similarly, I think the Crimean issue is by no means the central issue in here. Uh, if the issue simply were the self-determination of the people in the Crimean, they could have dealt with that 10 years ago, they could have had an international conference on it, they could have, had, could have done a number of things. 
The Russian side said, for example, we have the right to station 25,000 troops. This is not an invasion. But that's not true. There's so much of what the Russian side says, which they hear on their uh, you know, media there, which is simply not true. They have the right to station troops there on their naval base. They don't have the right to overrun the Crimean with soldiers dressed in, uh, you know, uh, Russian army gear, dri ridden, you know, driving around in Russian military uh, uh, vehicles with Russian weapons without their insignia on, taking over strategic uh, uh, Ukrainian assets. That's just not true. That's an invasion from the base. It's still an invasion. Uh, also, the the idea that that the uh, I mean, if the people in the in the uh, in the Crimea want to have independence, I don't know. Maybe they should be able to have a referendum on it, but not in ten days. Not in the present state of hysteria. Uh, Scotland's going to have a you know, and again the Russians say, "Well, Scotland has a rep referendum in independence." Yeah, it's taking two years to organize. We've had referendums in Quebec for two years, uh, twice, and it takes time to organize. There's all kinds of rules and stuff. Uh, but I, I still. You know, uh, because we have the situation in Quebec, I'm, I, I can see where the Ukrainians are coming from because they are trying to create their, you know, strengthen that sense of nation state around their language. Uh, and so they feel that, that Russian is so much more powerful as a language, as an international language, that they have to create space for Ukrainian. Just as in Quebec, the Quebecois, like in Quebec, when I lived there, at least 18% of the population was English speaking. And yet English is not an official language in Quebec. Now a lot of half the English speaking population has left. So now the English speaking population is only 10%, but that's still a lot of people. It's 800,000 or so people. Yet it's not an official language in Quebec. To my mind, what would it hurt them to have English as official language there? Montreal is a totally bilingual city. And yet the, the nationalists, the Quebec nationalists, they, they seek to try to deny, in fact, that Montreal is bilingual. They think bilingualism is bad, uh, almost. Some of them, the nationalists. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, if I look at the reaction of English Canadians towards the legitimate sort of national aspirations of the Quebecois, French-speaking North Americans, they're very unsympathetic, like zero. I wouldn't say all of them, but a lot of them. And there is sort of like, well, we won the war in whenever it was, the Battle of Quebec, so just shut up and you're lucky we let you speak French. That type of attitude is quite common. And so it's a big brother, small brother thing, which creates a lot of resentment on the side of the Quebecois. Who sense that? And similarly, Canadians vis-a-vis -vis Americans, we often have the sense that they're big, they do what they want, they come in with heavy feet, and what's good for them is good for us. And as a consequence, there is actually a fair amount of sort of anti-Americanism in Canada. Most of it not justified, uh, not justified at all, in my opinion, uh, but it's there. And I, I kind of see some of those big brother, small brother relationships between the Russians and the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian being small brother. So they have the small brother complex and the Russians kind of think, well, you know, you guys, A, you're just inventing your identity anyway and uh, you should just do what we tell you and, and we get to run things in your country, but you don't get to run things in our country kind of thing. So all of those things are playing, uh, you know, in, the, in this thing. But the big thing to my mind is, you know, as, as I mean, we're in a small world today. Like I can sit here in my uh, little room here in Vancouver and I can watch this discussion uh, between people in Russia and, and uh, between Moscow and Kiev. That's amazing and because I speak the language. It's okay, so you got to be able to speak the language. And so, I mean, I remember reading when I read the 18, or at least 1812, uh, uh, War and Peace. And Tolstoy talks about how, what led up to this tremendous, uh, you know, tragic, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people losing their lives as a result of Napoleon's invasion of Russia. And it starts with one decision here, another decision there, another decision there. And pretty soon this kind of gathers momentum and it has a sort of a life of its own. It's like the First World War. People went off to war all, you know, beating their chests and, uh, you know, the Germans, even the socialists in Germany and France and everywhere, they all voted to go to war. And, and you know, four years later, however many millions of people have died for nothing. So there are no quick and easy wars. Uh, it, it's going to be pretty messy. Now, the Russians are massing troops, I gather, if I believe what I hear, uh, in the eastern part of, of the Ukraine. 
I mean, I understand that this is Putin. He doesn't move softly, like he doesn't move softly internally or externally. He didn't like the fact that he, he felt that the events in, uh, in, in Ukraine were out of his control. So he was going to reestablish control. So he's going to take uh, the Crimea with his troops stationed there in, the, in, the, in their, uh, their uh, Black Sea fleet base there. And he's going to rattle his saber. And he's make the Ukrainians realize, you know, we're much more powerful than you. And we're very united because he's clamping down uh, increasingly on, on uh, the press in Russia. Although here we have this telekanal dosht. So it's not that black and white. But uh, he wants to make them realize that, uh, you know, you're not going to. And, and to the extent that there is a danger that the uh, people in power in Kiev have too much influence from these extreme nationalist groups, Putin is providing a counterweight to that. And initially, I think in an attempt to influence events, and hopefully this would lead then to an election where we would have a government in the Ukraine that would be balanced appeal to a broad spectrum of Ukrainian society, maintain good relations with Russia, and not be in a hurry to charge off and join Europe. So this was his means of trying to control the situation. Hopefully things don't get out of hand. That's I would like to wake up on Monday and see that there's an international conference on Crimea, Ukraine, all this kind of stuff and how everything's going to be calmed down again. Interesting too on sanctions. The British probably not too keen on having uh, too many sanctions on, on Russian assets abroad because the London city benefits tremendously from this uh, Russian investments in, in London. Of course, the Germans uh, rely on Russian gas. So the whole thing is pretty complicated. Hopefully we can start edging towards a de-escalation sometime soon. And I think in that sense, even though there was not that much agreement between the Russians and the Ukrainians in this exchange, I mean, that's the kind of thing you have to have. You have to have people talking. In that sense, too, I, I listened to an interview with the uh, head of the Crimean Tatars who had visited with Vladimir Putin, which is, again, extremely important because uh, he uh, is very much a pro, you know, my government, the Ukrainian government. So I'm sure he went there as well with some uh, instructions from the Ukrainian government. And there were, he didn't tell us everything that he had to say to Vladimir Putin. So hopefully things uh, calm down and I hope that doesn't get too many people on either side of this uh, dispute angry at me, although probably it will. Bye for now.